here in just a moment. Uh, give me one second. I'll look up something here. Okay. Amen. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come before your awesome presence to say thank you, thank you, thank you for the breath of life. Thank you for this opportunity, oh God, to come before your presence once again, oh God, as we study your word. We ask, oh God, that you clear our minds and our hearts from the business of the day, that you lead, guide, and direct us in the way of truth and righteousness, that you will be glorified. I thank you, oh God, for your goodness and mercy bestowed upon us. Open my heart, so God, open our hearts to be receptible, to receive the word of God tonight, oh God, that will help strengthen, encourage, edify, and build us up in our faith, oh God. Areas of our lives that need to be changed, be refined, to be purified, to be saturated in your presence, do it for your glory, God. As we yield ourselves into your lordship and your authority, that you lead and guide and direct us in the way you ordain that we should walk in truth and in your righteousness. And we give you glory, give you honor, give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I got my fiance sitting in back of me. Thank the Lord. I'm trying to get her to teach one of these days. You got to bring the chicken out of her. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. She's a mighty woman of God. She's very knowledgeable of the word herself. I thank the Lord for that. And I just pray that God continue to, to endow her with his wisdom, his knowledge, his enlightenment of the truth of God's word. We started out, um, we, when we left off the last lesson we were discussing, we were talking about um, the illuminated word, the illuminated word. And it's very important as a child of God. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you for joining tonight. It's very important as we study the Word of God to allow God to bring the enlightenment of the Word of God into our hearts. Because where there's light, darkness has to flee. And one thing about God's Word, you cannot live in darkness and live in light at the same time. i never seen any person walk into a dark room and try to have light at the same time in darkness. It doesn't work that way. Because anything that brings light, it exposes the darkness and causes the darkness to be eliminated. And that's what God's words wants to do is eliminate the sinful issues in our lives and, and begin to expose the areas of our life that need to be changed, to be defined, to be purified, to be cleansed, to be saturated in his anointing. God bless you, Pastor Denise and Dennis. God bless you. Thanks for joining. And when the word of God is, is revealed into our hearts, it should bring such encouragement, not only encouragement, but joy. You should have joy when the word of God comes into your heart because it's the word that gives you the strength and the power and the ability to defeat our adversary. One thing about the word of God, it tells us that our adversary is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that's one thing we got to be aware of that we have an adversary. Many people don't realize the adversary is anytime you resist God and oppose God's word and walk in rebellion, you're giving power to the adversary to come into your life, to do just what he wants to do in your life, to bring you to a place of destruction. And God wants us to know tonight that it's very vital to your Christian walk is allowing the word of God to be revealed to you because if you don't allow the word of God to get into your heart, how are you going to live? The word tells us, man should not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it's very important as a child of God to recognize that if I don't allow the word of God to be manifest in my life, how can I live a victorious life? I cannot live a victorious life if I don't have the word of God in my life. In 2 Peter Second Peter chapter two, Second Peter chapter two, verse nine, it says, "The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished." So it's very enlightening to know that God knows you're going to be tempted. He you knows you're going to be tried by the enemy. You're going to be tested. 
but he also has the remedy to bring you out of your temptation. Only if you submit to the Lord. Give me one second. Look at something here. We have to submit every day. We have to submit because if you don't submit to the Lord, how can you walk in obedience? Because we can't do it in our own strength. If we try to do it in our own strength, we just make a mess of things. And one thing about God's word, it, it reveals us that God searched the heart and examined the mind. And Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examines the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what deeds they deserve. So God knows, he knows if we l learn how to submit to him and resist, resist the devil, the devil got to flee from you. He got to flee. It's a guarantee. He has no power. James chapter 4, verse 7. It tells us, let me see, I'm going to use the uh, English Standard Version. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's what we have to learn how every day is have an attitude of submission. It's an attitude of submission. And that's when I get to the place, I recognize that without the power of God working in my life, I am vulnerable to the enemy's bait. And we've been talking about this for, uh, for several months now, about the bait of Satan. What is it in your life that you allow the enemy to bait you with? Think about it. Check your own heart, examine your heart, and find out in yourself what is it that's causing me to resist and oppose God and allow the Spirit of God to bring you to a place of understanding and clarity for who you are in Christ Jesus. It's very important as a child of God to study, to show yourself approved unto God as a workman that need not to be ashamed. That's what the Word tells us, right? So if I don't get into the place, allow the Word to be an enlightenment to my heart, how can I know what's in my heart that's not right if I don't have the word of God spoken by the Holy Spirit to tell me and bring conviction to my heart that something's wrong with my heart condition. We have to recognize our heart posture. Where is your heart posture tonight? Is your heart posture lining up with the word of God? Is your heart posture in a position of submission? Is your heart posture in a heart, an attitude of obedience? So no matter what comes my way, no matter what test I'm being tested with, tried, proven with, I know within myself that I'm a true child of God. So it doesn't matter what the enemy brings my way, it's not going to throw me for a loop because I know what God has done in my life. It's very important. It's very important to recognize where you are in the spirit. Are you walking Dying to yourself daily, as the word tells us, and living in the spirit of truth, or are you allowing yourself to keep living according to the dictates of your flesh? I was uh found a post on my mother's door when I visited her for Thanksgiving, and I found this very interesting. And my pastor talked about this in our church before if you were on trial, and it said, If you were on trial for being a Christian. Would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's, that caught my attention because I said, if I'm on trial for being a Christian, am I going to have enough evidence to prove that I was loyal? I was dependable. I was walking in obedience to God's truth and righteousness. I was living for the Lord all the days of my life. Or was I stagnant? Or was I walking in unbelief? Was I giving into sin periodically because of my self-denial? I wouldn't deny myself of the fleshly appetites, I denied it of the spiritual appetite. And that's something God began to speak to me when we were uh, doing this lesson tonight. When he told me about this lesson, no other option. Our subject tonight is no other option. Because many times, we make an option of choices to continue to sin. We have options. We have a whole list of things that's an opportune thing we can do that presents itself to us, an opportunity that, that baits you into the entrapment of the enemy 
So I seized the moment of rebelling. I seized the opportunity to resist God. So the more I resist God, the more I allow myself to be baited and entrapped and ensnared by my own words. Your words, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Your words have so much power. You have the power to heal yourself by your words. You have the power to keep yourself in suffering and sorrow by your confession. Just like a person have a headache. And the more you keep confessing, I have a headache, it gets worse. Have you ever experienced that? Anybody experienced that? Because it, it's your confession. I found myself years ago, I would get a headache. But because I was taught by many different pastors and bishops and apostles, different leaders in the ministry, that your confession has the power to deliver you. So when a headache come upon me, instead of quickly popping pills for the headache, I go find myself in a place where I sit down and be still. Just rest my mind. Rest my heart. <coughs> and allow the Holy Spirit to bring such a calmness to where eventually the headache leaves. For I realize the headache is gone. Been about an hour and set in peace. No television, no computer, no music, just totally quietness. And all of the stuff that's bombarding my mind, all of a sudden, depreciated. Because I got into the place God wanted me to be. While well, I was able to just rest my spirit. That's another point. A lot of issues that we face in our lives happens because we refuse to rest. We refuse to enter into God's rest. The children of Israel, Hebrews chapter 12, you find in that, that passage. In the latter part of that chapter, God says the children of Israel, he said they did not enter in to the promised land because of their unbelief. They refuse to rest <coughs> in what God has spoken to them. And that's where we got to get to the place in ourselves. Where we learn how to listen to our body. Your body will tell you we need to rest. We all can attest to that. If you don't rest, your body start breaking down. Stuff start happening. You start getting sick. You start getting a cold or cold symptoms. Why? Because the body trying to tell you it's time to sit down and rest. But what we do, we ignore the warning signs. We ignore it. <coughs> we get into a place in ourselves. We refuse to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So we find ourselves struggling and being stuck in a dark place where sickness all of a sudden starts bombarding our body. So it's very important as a child of God to listen to your, your body when it begins to talk to you. So tonight we're going to talk about no other options. The first five years of marriage for my, for my wife and me were very tough. We had hurt each other so severely that it seemed impossible to savage the loving relationship we once had. I don't know what that noise is. Only one thing kept us together. We both knew God had ordained our marriage. Therefore, we did not make divorce an option. Our only option was to believe he would heal and change us. We both commit ourselves to the process, no matter how painful. When I had thoughts of giving up, I remember the promises God had given me concerning our marriage. And I was not ready to abort what God had designed and decree for our union together. We talked about this in the last lesson, but I felt like re recapping this again because we need to be reminded of the importance of listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. One promise God had given us was that my wife and I would minister together. And at the time he gave it, I thought I could easily see that his hand was on both of us for our ministry. 
in the midst of our marital storm, I could no longer see the promise clearly, but I refused to let go of it. And that's what God does. He reveals to you a prophetic word to tell you a promise he's going to manifest in your life. But it's up to you to begin to fast and pray and seek the face of God to get clarity and understanding of what type of ministry God has for you to do. Then it goes and said, natural hope was gone because of strife and pride that had entered our marriage. Yet there were still supernatural seeds of life in our hearts. That the promise was an anchor or foundation in the time we needed it. That's a great point right there. Where's your foundation? Is your foundation resting on strife and confusion in a relationship? Those of you who are married, is your relationship going through a storm, being tested, being shallow? Do it feel like it's about to dissolve and fall apart? Just like this man who wrote this book was letting us know his testimony of how his marriage was. And he said when they realized they still had the foundation that they needed, there was hope. As it turned out, God not only healed our relationship, but also made it much stronger than before. Why? Because they did not allow the adversary, who's like a roaring lion, enter in seeking whom he may devour to destroy their marriage. So instead, they pressed in to God. The whole point of the scenario is to realize when I'm being tested, tried and proven by, the, by God, am I going to stand and trust him when the storms of life rage against me and the billy begin to roll and then the, everything begin to happen in my life, Keanu and Confucius? Am I going to trust God? Or am I going to continue to allow my emotions, my feelings, to take over and cause so much confusion. And God is saying tonight, where is your faith? When the storms come against you, where is your faith? Job 20, 22nd chapter, verse 21. Job the 22nd chapter, verse 21. It says, submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. You want to prosper? You want to be successful in your Christian walk with the Lord? Get in a place of submission and allow the Spirit of God to bring you to a place where you be, depend totally on God. Depend totally on His provision, His ability, His promises. He spoke to you and stand on His Word. And in the process, you invite the promise, the covenant that God has made with you and me to manifest in your life. Not only that, it said we grew from the conflict by forgiving one another and learning from them. So you got to learn how to forgive in a marriage, in any relationship between a brother, a sister, a husband and a wife, a fiance and a fiance. Any relationship, you must learn how to forgive. You must learn how to be submissive to the Lord unto one another. And in return, you invite God's presence to come into your relationship to establish your foundation built on Jesus Christ. We talked about that in previous lessons about when Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Peter answered correctly. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. What rock? The foundation, which is Jesus Christ, that establishes this relationship that we need to have with Christ Jesus. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. Then it says, I considered my wife, not only my lover, my, but my best friend. But also minister, also the minister in whom I place in most confidence. 
and I confided her more than any other person. Why? Because the foundation was resting on Jesus Christ. So we God restored the relationship, God built the marriage, God allowed them to come together in one accord, and in return, he restored what the creeping locusts, the swarming locusts, the caterpillars, what the enemy has eaten and devoured in their relationship. God came along and restored it. And that's what God would do for you, my brother, my sister, tonight. He will come into your life and restore unto you what the enemy think is over. Enemy says you're going to divorce, you're going to fall apart, the marriage is not going to be successful. Why? Because that's what he does. He's a liar. And the father lies. And God says tonight, stand on the word. And when you stand on the word, the word is going to give you the ability to overcome. My God, my God, my God. This is good lesson. I hope somebody learned something tonight. hope you learned something tonight. In Joel... Chapter 1, Joel chapter 1, and verse 4, it says, That which the palmer worm hath left, and hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, and the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker, canker worm hath left, hath the caliper, caliper eaten. God says, Awake! Ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. The newness, the new relationship, all this points to Jesus Christ. If you study the word, you'll find out it's dealing with Christ. And then he goes on and says, verse 6, For a nation will come up upon the land, strong and without number, whose teeth, who are the teeth of a lion, and has the cheek, the teeth of great lions, and hath laid my vine waste and bark fig trees, and hath made it clean bare, and hath cast it away, and branches thereof are made white. He said, the lament, which means to weep, like a virgin girded with sackcloth for her husband of her youth. And this is what God was talking about, the judgment, because of rebellion. But in return, verse 14, he says, sanctify ye, ye of fast, and call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the nation, all the inhabitants of the land into a house of the Lord, your God, and cry unto the Lord. No other option. Until you get to the place where you're broken. God said there will be no sanctification. There's no deliverance. There's no restoration. No other option, just like this relationship. He testified about his marriage, whether the verge or divorce. But he realized there was no other option but to trust in the foundation of Jesus Christ. And this was Joel. It prophesied. He prophesied this word to the children of Israel to let them know that you need to repent before the Lord. In order, for, and that's right, for the manifestation, the mighty manifestation. Because when you repent before God and you do what God says to do, sanctify. Make yourself holy. Sanctify the word means set apart. Come back to the place of holiness. Because when I sanctify myself, I strip myself of my own ambition, my own attitude, my own mindset, my own lifestyle, my own things I desire to do with the flesh. And I come back realigning with the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth tells me to sanctify and come into the house of the Lord and begin to cry out for the mercy of God. Move on a little further. So after coming through the rough first five years, I realized that God saw flaws in both of our lives. You know, I just read. That's a key point right there. Key point. God saw flaws in both of our lives, the relationship, the marriage. God sees the error of your ways. And God is looking for you to recognize, 
God, I have a fault. I messed up. It's my fault my wife or my husband mad at me. Because of something I didn't do or something I should have done. Something I might have said. It might be something from the past I'm holding on to that's preventing me from having a fruitful marriage. And God is saying tonight, he sees the flaws. Glory to God. And he, and he says, and our relationship brought them out into what? The light. When we come together in a broken relationship and we're both broken, that's an opportunity for healing. That's an opportunity for God to show up and heal the broken heart and bind their wounds. And God says, when you get into that place in me, that's when I can do my work in you, a mighty work I can perform in your life to perfect the things that concern thee. So when the relationship was in the light, God began to show them, she's not just at fault by herself. You're not at fault by yourself. We both have a fault. And we recognize that the light shines. God comes in and he delivers. I was in awe of the wisdom of our being joined together as man and wife. Before I met Lisa, I prayed diligently for the woman I would one day marry. That choice was the second, the most important decision of my life. The next, the next step was obeying the gospel excitement of coming together in marriage, but secondly, the obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then on that, it said, because of praying, we waited for God's choice for mate, and I thought would not have a problem with others had in our marriage. He said, oh, how I was wrong. God selected a wife for me who was the desire of my heart, but she, she also exposed the selfish immaturity that was hidden in me. And there was, there was too much to run from the conflict by choosing divorce or blaming her would have only buried my immaturity under another layer of counterfeit protection called, check this out, offense. So we all have something in our lives that we blame others for. And we stand on it. We blame other people for our mistakes. Blame up the blame our significant other for our mess ups, for our faults. And God is saying, you can't do that. You got to recognize that you have an issue. And because of an argument, it exposed the immaturity. And the thing that we need to learn to realize that God has a way of bringing things into light in our lives that needs to be exposed in order for us to change. We cannot continue to keep hiding behind our habits and our addictions and our problems. We got to recognize that whatever it is in my life that's not of God, I got to admit it. I got to be real with myself. I got to be honest with myself and recognize how much I've been hiding and living a counterfeit protective life. And God began to expose it, and the false protection was my offense that I held against somebody else, even against myself. Knowing the word of God for marriage kept me from leaving. Knowing the word of God for marriage kept me from leaving. And that's where we have to get to the place where we know the word of God for ourselves. Because the word of God will expose everything the enemy has against you. I found a little reading. I want to read this here. It says marriage and love in the Bible. Marriage and love in the Bible. Marriage is a sacred vow between a man and a woman to become one flesh. As the scripture says, God views view of marriage is the divine plan for sexual relationship to secure stable families and committed parents and spouses. The Bible provides numerous verses that gives guidance for married couples, husbands, wives, newlyweds, and engagements. Scriptures offer valuable wisdom and advices whether you are considering a dating relationship, planning a wedding, or finding your marriage struggling. 
Then it says, most of these Bible verses focus on love and are a wonderful way to express your feelings of love and commitment to your spouse. When you face moments of hurt and pain, which happens in all our relationships, the scripture is also a good place to turn to. During the struggle in marriage, it is easy to focus on what is wrong instead of stopping and listening to God and asking for guidance. Ain't that something? We do it all the time. We're quick to hold on to an offense instead of asking God for guidance. We're quick to hold on to unforgiveness and the, and the pains and the hurts that we cause each other instead of recognizing this needs to be dealt with. So we brush it under the rug and we say, well, I'll deal with that later. So we both walk around the house mad at each other. When I was immature in marriage, young in marriage, I did exactly that. She did something, or I said something to her and made her mad. She mad at me. She walked around all day mad. Or I did something, or she did something to her, you know, or she did something to me, the opposite. I'm walking around mad. Instead of us reconciling, we married each other, walking around the house miserable. And the Holy Spirit was always speaking. Listen to me now. The Holy Spirit is always speaking to you. But because of the malice, and the anger, the pains, the hurt, the bruises, the scars in your heart, you're allowing the voice of God to be dampened. It's like putting the earplugs in your ear. So I ain't got to hear his voice. And the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal to you if you just be quiet and listen. She really got something good to say to bring, bring peace back into the relationship. Or this is what I want you to say to bring peace in the relationship. And every time we find ourselves in an altercation, God always spoke by his spirit something, and we just bust out laughing. And before you know it, we forgot all about the offense. Because now we allow the spirit of God to bring healing in the broken heart. And that's a message for somebody. During the struggling of a marriage, it's easy to focus on what is wrong instead of stopping and listening to the God and ask for his guidance. If you are seeking God's healing for your marriage, these Bible verses can remind you of your love and purpose in relationship. We've, and we've gathered scriptures to help you express your desires, fears, and hopes concerning marriage. And this is on BibleStudyTools.com. BibleStudyTools.com concerning marriage. And, th and there's a prayer for marriage. It says, Father, help me to be the husband or be the wife you have intended me to be. Show me where I need to improve. Help me to be a better communicator. Help me to love my husband or my wife better and help us both to grow closer to you and to each other. In your presence, we renew our wholehearted choice to love. Bless this holy commitment with courage, strength, tenacity, and most of all with joy. With you, we can build a successful marriage. In your name, Jesus, amen. So that's a prayer for somebody on here tonight. You can go back and listen to it and pray again. Because this is really helpful to help you get back that balance of the staggering relationship that you have going on in your life. Hey, Y'all, excuse me, I'm fanning a lot because I, I bought some plant dirt about a couple of months ago. And the plant dirt evidently has some bugs in it. Now I got all these little gnats flying around my house. So I got to continue to fight to get this stuff out of my house now because I, I tell you, it's, it's driving me crazy, annoying. I'm, I'm, I thank God that he gave me wisdom even to deal with this too. Buy some more dirt. Get rid of old dirt. So, so y'all pray for me. But anyway, back to our lesson tonight. So these scriptures, there's many scriptures on this website concerning marriage, even Hebrews 13 and 4. So let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexual, sexually immoral and adulterous. And then Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, good thing and obtain favor of the Lord. 
So back to our lesson. Because of praying and waiting on God's choice for the mate, he said, I thought we would have a problem. You know, we thought we, I would not have the problem up in their marriage. So, so you can't run from the conflicts. You got to face them. You got to recognize what, what it is in your relationship and allow God to deliver and set you free. At this point, I must detour from the main thrust of this chapter. So some of you who are reading this may be thinking, I was not saved when I was married. Check this out. To you, God says, now to the marriage, now, now to the married, I command you, yet not but to the Lord. A wife is not depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Then he goes on and said, Brother, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. And verse 24. So you get a chance, read 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 7. Really great passage to read. And I tell you, it's going to enlighten you. But thank God for Jesus and his grace. Let this word on the covenant of marriage be settled in your heart so that you are not moved from your steadfastness by the trap of offense. Then seek the Lord, seek the Lord, Seek the Lord, seek the Lord, keep saying it, seek the Lord, for his revealed word for your marriage. Some of you may not have married in the will of God as believers. To enter into the blessing of God for your marriage, you must repent not of seeking his counsel before marrying, and he will forgive you. Settle in it in your hearts that two wrongs don't make a right. You heard that? Two wrongs don't make a right. To break a covenant because of an offense is not the answer. To break a covenant because of an offense is not the answer. Then seek the Lord for his word for your marriage. Seek the Lord for his word for your marriage. And I guarantee when you do that, you find things begin to make a turn in the relationship, become fruitful, become abundant, become blessed, highly favored of God because of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The solid rock. We're going to talk about the solid rock. The revealed word of God is the solid rock on which we are to build our lives and ministry. Numerous people have told me of many churches or ministry teams they have been part of in and only a short time. My heart grieves as I see how they are moved by trials and not by God's direction. They extol how wrong things are and how badly they, they and uh, others are treated. They feel justified in their decisions. But their reasoning is, not, is only another layer of deception that keeps them from seeing the offense in their own character flaws. You hear what I said? You look at the mistakes and things that are in the church to only masquerade your own character flaws. So I'm quick to point out all the faults and failures in everybody else's life in the church, but I overlook my own mistakes. I overlook my own bad habits. So I see your bad habit. I point the finger at you, but I'm not looking at myself. <coughs> God is saying, excuse me, And God is saying tonight, look in the mirror of the word. Look in the mirror of the word. See what it is that's in your heart that needs to be exposed. And allow the spirit of God to bring you to a place of recollection where you begin to receive what it is that's wrong with you. Repent of it and allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart to bring deliverance. They describe their present relationship to ministries or church churches they are now part of as temporary or this is where God has made, made them for now to be. 
I've even heard one say, one man say, I'm alone to this church. So I'm on, I'm on loan to this church. They make these statements so that if things get difficult, they have an escape route. So I'm, I'm alone. I'm on loan. On loan, like, you know, you get a loan for your for a possession, jury, or house. You want to get a loan? He says, I'm on loan to this church. So he only, he only there under conditions and requirements. If things didn't go the way he wanted to go, that's an escape route. They have no foundation to stand on in the new places they go. Storms blow them easily to the next port. You know, a port like a docking station where the boats are. So when the winds blow, it blows you to a whole nother destination, a place where you find yourself comfortable to get out of the will of God. And that's what God is saying tonight. Don't allow the enemy to cause you to sin against God. Your reaction under pressure, reaction under pressure. I often say that trials and tests locate a person. In other words, they determine where you are spiritually. They reveal the true condition of your heart and how you react under pressure and how it is revealed the way you react. You can have a house built on the sand that is five stories high and beautiful, decorated with the most elaborate materials and craftsmen, craftsmanship. As long as the sun is shining, it looks like a bulwark of strength and beauty. And next to the house, you can have a single story plain house. And almost unnoticeable and possibly unattractive compared to the beautiful edifice next to it. But it's built on something you can't see, a rock. So we discussed this before in previous lessons. So your foundation needs to be resting on Jesus Christ. And as he is the foundation, he's the only one who has the ability and the power to sustain you. To sustain you when the pressures come against you. When life throws its, its best at you to bring you to confusion and derision. God has the power to bring you out of that dark, stormy life and speak peace in the atmosphere and cause a calmness in your spirit. When the enemy shakes, it is to destroy. But God has a different purpose. When the enemy shakes or strikes against you, it's for the purpose of destroying you. But God has a different purpose. One of the commentators wrote in this book and said, I would like to thank God for being the message, for the message of the bait of Satan. I've been fasting and praying for breakthrough in my life. The Lord led me to the message and it radically changed my life. This is a must read for all who are in leadership. So this book, The Bait of Satan, is one you need to add to your library. If you don't have it, you need to get it. You can find this book at christianbooks.com. Christianbooks.com, www.christianbooks.com. You'll find that book, The Bait of Satan. It's on there for about $18. It was on sale a few weeks ago for $9.99. <clears throat> so if you don't have that book, you need to get that book. All that can be shaken will be shaken. All that can be shaken will be shaken. As he said, he has promised, saying, yet once I have shaken not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that were being shaken as things that are made, that things which cannot be shaken may remain. And that's what Jesus did when he rose from the dead. He shook things that was not of God. That all that 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 was to remain, which is the gospel, will remain. In previous chapters, we saw the revealed word of God is the foundation on which Jesus builds his church. We watched Simon Peter remain even when other disciples left offended. 
Even when Jesus gave him an opportunity to leave, Simon Peter spoke what was established in his heart. Now let's look at another test for Simon Peter, the night Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was seated with the 12, his 12 apostles, giving thanks and serving communion. When he had made a starly statement, behold, the hand of my betrayers is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been, has been determined. But woe to that man to whom by woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. St. Luke chapter 22, verse 21 through 20, 22. St. Luke <clears throat> chapter 22, verse 21 and 22. What an announcement. We would say today that Jesus had dropped a bomb with those words. Although Jesus knew from the beginning that he would be betrayed, it was the first his disciples had heard of it. Can you imagine the horrible feeling the room, as he has said, that one of them who has been with him from the start, a close associate, was going to betray him? In response, they began to question among themselves which one of them it was who would, be, would do this thing. Verse 23. They were overwhelmed with shock that one of them would be capable of such a horrifying thing. But their motive for this investigation was not pure. We know this by how the conversation ended. The reason for this inquest was selfish and full of pride. Look at the very next verse in the scripture. Now there was also dispute among them as to which, uh, which of them should be considered the greatest. Luke chapter 22, verse 24. Picture this. Jesus told them that he was about to be turned over to the chief priest to be condemned to death and delivered to the Romans to be mocked, scourged, and killed. The one who would do this was sitting with him at the table. The disciples questioned who it was, and they ended up in an argument about which of them would be the greatest. It was dishonorable, almost like children arguing over an inheritance. There was no concern for Jesus. Their jockeying for power and position. What an unimaginable selfishness. So they had a hidden motive and a hidden agenda that entered to their hearts when Jesus gave the statement, in other words, drop the bomb, that I'm going to be delivered to the Romans and I'm going to die. So instead of being concerned for his well-being, <clears throat> selfishness entered to their hearts. And that's what God is saying tonight. When you know that you're under attack and you know that it's the enemy behind the attack, don't get into a selfish attitude and start blaming somebody else for your offenses. But recognize, just like Jesus knew the disciples was going to do this, behave this way, it never, not one time, made him neglect the purpose of going to the cross. But he considered the cross even when everybody else abandoned him. They had been with Jesus in position. I might have asked if they were, if they had heard of what I had said, or even if they had cared. We see from this incident of an example how the master walked in love and patience. Most of us in Jesus' place would have said, every one, one of you, get out. I'm in my greatest hour of need, and you're thinking of yourselves. What an opportunity to become offended. Think about it. You in a room with all your family and your friends, and you tell them, I'm about to be put, put in jail. I'm about to lose my house. I'm about to lose my car. I'm about to lose my family. Things are going so bad in my life, I'm about to lose everything I have. And also, you start thinking about, oh, what can I get from them? Oh, let me get this jewelry. Oh, let me get let me get this, this coat. Let me get this this uh this dress. Let me let me get this hat. So selfishness into to the hearts. Instead of them being concerned about you 
and say, let's gather together and pray that God's will be done in your life to restore what he been stolen from you. They have a self with agenda. Who, who cares what you're about, about to go through? And that's what the enemy does. He gets people in the mindset where he don't care what's going on in your life. So you surround people around you to test you, to prove you, to define you, to make you take an examination of your heart. See, if I'm going to be easily offended, or am I going to be easy to listen to the voice of the Spirit? Because we have a choice. There's no other option. The Word tells us, when God told Joshua, tell the children of Israel, I set before you life and death. Choose life and live. He gave them an opportunity to choose death or life, but then he gave them the answer of the right decision to choose. The same way it is with us today. You have a choice. In a broken relationship, a broken marriage, divided home, messed up life, you have a choice to make a decision within yourself. Am I going to follow the voice of the Holy Spirit? Allow God to make my heart a pliable, where he can pour into me the oil of joy, the anointing, fill me with the word, empower me by his spirit, or am I going to continue to hold on to offenses of what somebody done to me? They may have done something to somebody close to you, and you're mad about it. And the Holy Spirit says tonight, doesn't matter what it is, Whatever that offense is, make it right. Let go of it. Allow the Holy Spirit to purge your heart from offense. Offense. People don't realize this. I'm going to make this final point, And then we're going to come to a close tonight. We'll pick it up next week, the same chapter. People don't realize when you hold on to offense, you invite the enemy into your heart to afflict you. Some are spiritually afflicted and many are physically afflicted because of offense. Offense is a deadly entrapment the enemy uses against the body of Christ because he knows if I can bring the house full of offensive folk, I can destroy what God has established on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we got to get to the place we recognize no matter how mad you get, repent of the anger. Because the word tells us, be not hasty to become angry. For anger rests in the bosom of fools. And if you allow the enemy to cause you to hold on, keep holding on to anger about any situation, you're making yourself a fool in the eyes of God. And God says tonight, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. If you're a child of God tonight, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you tonight about offense, about the bait that Satan set before you to entrap you, to lure you away from your purpose, lure you away from the promises God has for your life, or lure you away from the plan God has for your life, God says tonight, repent. Allow the Spirit of God to come into your heart, to cleanse you, to sanctify you, to perfect you in the presence of God. And he'll do just that by his spirit. So Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this word. I pray, oh God, this word has not fallen from deaf ears, but he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. Convict our hearts, change our lives, change our attitudes, change our desires, that we have your godly desire to do what's right and walk in obedience that you will be glorified in the life that we live before you in the pathway that we walk in that's being governed and guided by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I do this every week. If you're on here tonight, you might be a backslider. You once walked with the Lord and you strayed away. God says he loves you. He cares about you. He's married to you. You might be on here tonight 
never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or you may have thought you accepted Jesus, but yet you've still been living according to your flesh. The word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. If you are not sure of your salvation tonight, and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Bible says that there was a man who had a hundred sheep, and he lost one of his sheep. He left the 99 to go and find that one lost sheep. That might be you tonight. The Lord is seeking for you right where you are to come and find you, to bring you to his presence. They can deliver you and set you free from the inside out. I want us all to pray this simple prayer tonight. It's going to cover everybody on this line tonight, even those in the atmosphere. It's going to cover. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I want you to repeat after me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. As you come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, knowing unknowingly. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Sanctify me by your truth. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Again, I thank you for tuning in tonight to our weekly Bible class. I pray that it has blessed you tonight and it encourages you to get in God's word, to study God's word. Allow that word to manifest in your heart. Manifest. When you speak the word over yourself, speak it over your children. Speak the word over your possessions. Speak the word over your finances. Speak the word over your health. And I guarantee the word will work if you allow it to work. So Lord, now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest with and bind us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anyone have any questions? Any comments? Amen. This lesson has been a blessing. You sent up some hearts tonight. Send those hearts up. Has this really been a blessing to you tonight? Allow the Spirit of God um, minister um, to you. Excuse me, Robin had a question. She okay. Said, um, how do you contain yourself? How do you... Okay, I see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see your questions, uh, Sister Davis. God bless you for joining. Appreciate it. Okay. How do you contain yourself as an always standing in character, even when being driven out of character? Well, one thing, the only way to drive you out of character is when you take your focus off of Jesus. When you keep your focus on Jesus, he gives you the foundation upon himself to keep standing and trusting him in his word. The only way the enemy can pull you out of your character if I give into the flesh. The word tells us if you walk in the spirit, and you might say, how do I walk in the spirit? By obeying God's word, listening to God's word. If you find even a uh, uh, ministerial tape or CDs or something on YouTube to feed your spirit the word, the more I feed myself of the word, I'm not coming out of character. Because it's the word that has the sustaining ability to keep me planted in Christ Jesus. So nobody can easily pull me out. I've been in places where people offended me many, 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 many times. I'm keeping it real. And it hurt. And I was mad. However, I never let them see me angry because I had a, always taught myself through other ministries and other, other pastors and uh, other leaders. No matter how angry you get, you go pray. You go seek the face of God. Tell God, God, I'm mad. God, I'm angry. Take this off of me. And guess what he does? He has sent people in your life to encourage you, to help strengthen you, to keep standing in your faith in God. Did I answer your question? Amen. Did, um, did I answer your question? So that's the only way any one of us can maintain a righteous stand in the Lord is when we recognize that it's the enemy behind the offense that's trying to pull me out of character. That's why so many people find themselves so quickly cussing somebody out. they quick to become angry at other folk when people do things to them. It's because you're allowing the enemy to pull you out of character. We teach in our leadership class every first Sunday to our leaders regarding the integrity and the character. Because your integrity is your loyalty and dependence on God.
to lead God and direct you. And your character is his nature being revealed through you in your everyday walk. So I'm not going to live one way behind closed doors and then get in front of people and put on a counterfeit relationship like I'm really walking with Christ. And a lot of people do that. And that's what God wants us to do is recognize these, these signs. They're, they're warning signs. I'm going to say this one point before we go. God gives us warning signs. Every time the enemy comes to test, try and prove you, there is a warning sign. And you might feel yourself about to shift when that warning signal comes because there's an offense behind that warning signal to warn you that the enemy is about to attack you, or about to attack your children, about to attack your marriage, about to attack your finances, about to attack your health. And the Spirit of God says, pay attention. There's a warning signal. Go in prayer. Begin to fast. Read the scriptures. Go and pray. Because a lot of times we hear God speaking to us, but we allow our flesh to overpower his voice. So we're going to continue this next week. God bless you, Carol. Thank you for joining. And that's one thing God wants to do. Be real with ourselves. We're human. We're going to make mistakes. We might cut somebody out every now and then. We might fall short of the glory of God. But one thing about it, you recognize the spirit behind that spirit that's attacking you. And when you recognize it's not of God, Lord, put a bit in my mouth, a bridle on my tongue. Just like the, the rider of a horse, they put a bit in the horse's mouth because they got a guy in the horse and they put a bridle on his tongue so the horse won't get out of line. And they guide the horse in the direction it wants to go. And that's what God says about our tongue. We got to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our mouth in every direction we go in life. Because death and life is in the power of the tongue. And you'll be satisfied in your belly by the fruit of your tongue. So whatever I speak, life or death, blessings or cursing, he says, it's my choice because I am a child of God. And as a child of God, I have to learn how to discipline myself. That's why Paul, Apostle Paul says in one statement, so I buffet myself daily. So I beat this flesh daily to submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So I pray you all be encouraged tonight. Continue to let the Lord lead, guide, and direct you in his word. Study the word. Get the word in your confession. Memorize the word if you have to. Because the word will keep you from the attacks and the bait that Satan brings to you to entrap or ensnare you. Amen. Y'all have a blessed night. Any other one, anyone else have any questions before we go? Anyone else have a question? If not, you can inbox me your questions, and I'll respond to them accordingly. So you can always find me, on, uh, as we are on live tonight, on the same account, Charles B. Emery. You can find me on here, and I'll answer your uh, questions if you got any you want to share tonight. Amen? Y'all have a blessed night. Shalom. Peace be to you.